when you're trained as a computer scientist, you realize there are really two steps in understanding a new, an algorithm. First is to understand what are the inputs and what are the outputs of that algorithm. In other words, what does the algorithm do? And second is to understand the procedure that computes the outputs from the inputs. That is, how does the algorithm do it? And I, I particularly, <clears throat> particularly want to focus on the inputs and the outputs because if you don't understand the inputs and the outputs, you probably can't understand the procedure. And if the author of an article hasn't clearly communicated the inputs and the outputs, you're probably not going to understand what the algorithm does. So really have your antennae out for what are the inputs and outputs of a bioinformatics algorithm. <clears throat> well, we use the term metapsych family of pathway genome databases to describe the roughly 4,000 databases that have been developed using our pathway tool software, both at SRI and at other institutions around the world. These, these databases cover all domains of life with an, a microbial emphasis. And the reason we call them the metapsych family is that these databases are derived from our metapsych database that I'll describe in a moment via a computational pathway prediction approach. Now, the overall metapsych family contains roughly 4,000 databases. We're not exactly sure how many there are. Our biopsych collection at SRI contains 3,000 databases for mostly sequenced microbial genomes and a few eukaryotic genomes as well. The other reasons that we call them the MetaPsych family is that they share a common database schema with MetaPsych and they're managed using the Pathway Tool software that also underlies MetaPsych. What's MetaPsych? MetaPsych is a metabolic encyclopedia that describes experimentally determined pathways and enzymes from all domains of life. Its goal is to describe every known experimentally elucidated pathway, although we haven't achieved that goal yet. Uh, it's Content comes from the literature, uh, and to date, MetaPsych contains 2,000 metabolic pathways that were studied in about 2,400 different organisms, according to the literature from which they've been drawn. Contains about 11,000 uh, biochemical reactions, and its contents have been derived from more than 35,000 publications since we started the project in about 1997. So the database is manually curated by a staff of PhD, PhD biologists who manually extract pathway and enzyme information from the literature. So MetaPsych is one of the highly curated databases within the BioPsych collection. The other very highly curated database, meaning its contents have come from literature curation, is our EcoPsych E. coli database, which is a model organism database for E. coli. Its contents have been derived from about 25,000 publications, of which about half are shared with MetaPsych. And it's, it's a multi-dimensional annotation of the E. coli genome in the sense that it describes many, many facets of information about E. coli. Not only the positions of genes and functions of genes, but our curators offer, author many review summaries about E. coli genes and pathways. It also describes multimeric complexes of E. coli, E. coli metabolic pathways, and many types of E. coli regulation, from transcription factor-based regulation to att attenuation to small RNA regulation. The, the majority of the other databases in the BioPsych collection of 3,000 databases have not undergone that level <clears throat> of manual curation, since it takes huge resources to do that. The majority of them have been developed computationally using our pathway tool software where the approach is to take as the input the annotated genome for an organism. By annotated, I mean that other programs have been used to find the genes in the organism and predict their functions. And that's the input to pathway tools. And the, path sorry, the pathologic component of pathway tools converts that annotated genome to a pathway genome database format and then infers the reactome and the pathways and the operons of the organism. Once we've created a pathway genome database, the navigator component of pathway tools can be used to query and visualize the contents of the database using genome browser and metabolic pathway display and metabolic map visualization tools. It also has omics data analysis tools that I'll discuss in my talk this afternoon. 
The editor's component of Pathway Tools is what our curators and what other database developers use to extend and refine and curate a database to improve its quality. And then the Metaflux component of Pathway Tools is used to develop a genome scale metabolic model from a Pathway Genome Database. So how do we infer metabolic models from a sequenced genome? an annotated genome? Well, as I stated earlier, there are four basic steps, which I'll now go through in a bit more detail. Those are reactome inference, inference of metabolic pathways, generation of the metabolic model, and gap filling of the metabolic model. Let's look at each one of those in turn. <clears throat> well, the inputs to the reactome inference step are simply the, the protein list of the organism. More specifically, what we'd like to have ideally for each protein in the genome is a function name for the protein, like carbamate kinase, and its EC number if it's an enzyme, and the gene ontology terms describing the function of the protein. The reason it's nice to have EC numbers and gene ontology terms is that they come from a controlled vocabulary that's very easy for computers to interpret as opposed to the natural language English descriptions of enzyme function or protein function that are often used. The outputs of reactome inference is simply a list of the biochemical reactions catalyzed by the enzymes of the organism. <clears throat> and what the software does is to copy from MetaPsych the reactions and their substrates from that reactome into the new pathway genome database that we're inferring. So, as an example, the, the string, the phrase carbamate kinase would be converted to the reaction equation shown here, along with each substrate and the chemical structures of each substrate. Now, one component of that reactome inference is a tool that we call the enzyme name matcher. <clears throat> what it does is to match enzyme names in the genome with enzyme names that we've collected for many years in MetaPsych, because as you probably know, enzyme names have many, many different synonyms, so you can't count on the, the same enzyme always being referred to using the same unique name. And if you look carefully at genome annotations, you'll see that when people annotate a genome, they put lots of extraneous information into the protein function name. And I'd like to encourage you to avoid that if you can, because all these extraneous words like putative and hypothetical and alpha subunit and gene names and uh, et cetera, make it harder for computers to figure out what is the function of a given enzyme. Although our enzyme name matcher has a lot of tricks in it to try to uh, prune off all this extraneous information. So that's how reactome inference works. We essentially look up enzyme names and EC numbers and go terms in MetaPsych, and so MetaPsych helps us perform that translation from a protein function to a reaction equation. Well, people sometimes ask me, why bother to predict metabolic pathways at all? Why not just use the reaction list of the organism? Why do we need pathways at all? Well, pathways are useful for a couple of reasons. They, they help people uh, uh, reason with the metabolic network more effectively because a list of 1,000 reactions is very hard to hold in your head, whereas a list of 100 pathways or 200 pathways is a bit more mentally tractable. Pathways are also useful because uh, there are often missing enzymes in curated genomes, in annotated genomes, and pathways essentially guide us and identify for us very easily the, the enzymes that are missing because it's very straightforward for the computer to enumerate all the reactions within inferred pathways that have no enzyme assigned to it, to them. Uh, pathway inference also can copy those missing reactions into the metabolic network, thereby making the reaction network more complete. And pathways can also be used for the analysis of high throughput data, uh, and, and you'll see in my talk this afternoon how we can use pathways to perform visualization and enrichment analysis of uh, high throughput data. Why is pathway prediction hard? Well, first, because reaction, the reactome inference often misses reactions or incorrectly infers reactions, so the reactome inference is not always correct. And also, some reactions, because they're present in multiple pathways, don't provide uh, unambiguous evidence for the presence of one pathway or another. 
So how does pathway inference work? Well, its inputs are the organism reaction list, and its outputs are the inferred pathways of the organism. Those pathways are, are copied from the Metasite database into the new PGDB that we're creating. And what the pathway inference algorithm considers when it's scoring each pathway in Metapsych uh, and attempting to decide whether or not that pathway is present in the organism we're considering is, first of all, what fraction of the reactions in that pathway are present in the organism, present in the reactome of the organism. It also considers whether there are enzymes present for reactions that are unique to that pathway. So although some reactions are present in multiple pathways, many reactions are unique to a given metabolic pathway and so provide uh, stronger evidence for the presence of that pathway. We also have a notion in Metapsych of key reactions that help us distinguish some pathways from one another. For example, the TCA cycle and the Calvin cycle share many reactions in common uh, but by looking for the presence of one key enzyme, uh, we, it makes it much easier to differentiate those two pathways. We also have a notion in Metapsych of taxonomic range. So we annotate many pathways in Metapsych with the expected taxonomic groups that those pathways are expected to be found in. And we require more evidence for the pathway algorithm to infer the presence of a pathway outside its expected taxonomic range meaning we require a lot of evidence to infer a, a plant pathway as present in a bacterium. Okay, so those, that's the basics of how we infer react, the reactome of an organism and infer the metabolic pathway complement of an organism. Let's now talk about how a metabolic model is generated from the reactome and the pathways of the organism that we've just inferred. So in fact, the pathways are actually not used in the inference of metabolic models. Uh, so you can, so what the inputs to generation of a metabolic model are the following. They are a list of chemical nutrients required for the growth of, an, of the organism, and a list of what we call biomass metabolites of the organism, namely the outputs of the biosynthetic machinery of the organism. Uh, essentially the, the chemical composition of the organism, which includes the amino acids, the cell wall components, DNA and RNA components, etc. Also the secreted compounds of the organism and the metabolic reaction list of the organism or the reactome of the organism. Those are the only inputs to a technique called flux balance analysis, which creates steady state quantitative models of metabolism. So the, the approach that uh, many people are using now for metabolic modeling is to create steady state models and not kinetic models, right? So steady state models describe uh, a steady state operation of the cell at equilibrium and they don't describe the tra trajectory of the system over time. And one of the big reasons that people prefer this type of modeling is that you don't need kinetic constants for all the enzymes in your system. You don't need concentrations of all the meta metabolites in the system. So these are the only inputs that you need, the ones I've listed here on the screen. The outputs of flux balance analysis are to compute steady state reaction fluxes for all the reactions in the metabolic network. That is essentially a flux rate, a rate at which the reaction is processing its reactants to produce its products is assigned to each reaction in the network. That rate could be zero for some reactions that aren't carrying flux in a particular state of the cell, uh, and it'll be non-zero for the reactions that are operative. Now some of the things that you can do with one of these models once you create it is you can remove reactions from your model computationally to predict the phenotypes of knockout mutants. So you can predict is there a non-zero growth rate of the cell if I remove this reaction or that reaction. You can also supply alternative input nutrient sets to the system to determine, to predict whether the cell will grow or not under different nutrient conditions. You can also predict with these models the growth rate of the cell and nutrient uptake rates and waste product secretion rates. So here's a little more detail about how these models work. Consider a given metabolite, M, 
that's being produced by two reactions in the metabolic network, and it's being consumed by three reactions in the metabolic network. Now, since, by definition, the, the cell is operating at steady state, there's no net production or consumption of that metabolite. Therefore, the production rate of the metabolite is balanced by the consumption rate of the metabolite. And so for each metabolite in the network, we write an equation like this. And in fact, we have our computer programs able to generate that full list of equations from a PGDB. We also define a few, exist, a few additional equations, uh, the exchange fluxes that import nutrients and export secretions are each modeled using an equation like that. And then there's a special biomass reaction that essentially lists every biomass metabolite from that set I mentioned earlier, and essentially says that the sum of all the biomass metabolites uh, produce biomass of the cell. That's, that's a special reaction, and the rate at which that reaction proceeds is essentially the growth rate of the cell in your model. And what you do is you submit all these equations to a linear optimization package, And you tell it to optimize either biomass production or ATP production or the production of some desired end product that you'd like to op optimize. And what people have found in practice is that the, so when you tell it to optimize, say, the rate of this biomass reaction, what it does is it assigns, it computes fluxes for each reaction that taken together make the network produce the biomass of the cell at an optimal rate. And what people have found is that when you use these optimization techniques, you get flux patterns that correspond very closely to what's observed experimentally. Let me give you a toy example to try to illustrate and give you a little more intuition for how this works. So imagine a very, very simple cell that only produces two bio, biomass metabolites, uh, ATP and alanine. And let's imagine that it produces them in the ratio of four alanines for every ATP. And let's imagine a very, very simple metabolic network shown here that uh, is present in this cell. Let's start out by constraining the glucose uptake rate to 100 units. We usually pick at least one input nutrient to constrain, and it kind of anchors the rest of the system. Well, if there's only one uh, reaction that imports glucose, um, then by definition of steady state, uh, this reaction must be proceeding at the same re rate as that reaction. Um, and there are two re reactions then that consume pyruvate. Now, since we're told in the biomass metabolite, in, in the biomass reaction, that alanine is produced, four alanines are produced for every ATP, then um, the, the relative rates of these reactions must be four to one. Note that these add up to 200 because there are two pyruvate produced for every one of the 100 glucose that are coming in. And it's using all 200 of them in order to optimize the amount of biomass production. Now, if there are 40 oxygen being consumed, there must be 40 oxygen being uptake into the cell. Now, a couple things to note here are that there could be hundreds of other reactions present in the reaction list, but because none of those reactions apparently are needed to produce alanine or ATP, they're essentially irrelevant and they're, they will all get a flux of zero. And so in flux balance modeling, it's really critical what is your biomass metabolite list because that list defines what reactions have to be present. It's also the case in these models that if there's a single biomass metabolite in your list of biomass metabolites that can't be produced by the metabolic network, then there's actually no solution to the optimization problem. And you essentially, that's, that's, the optimizer tells you, I can't find any non-zero solution that will produce your biomass. Well, that's actually a problem because you may not know, it doesn't tell you which of the biomass metabolites can't be produced. And so you're left with a big debugging problem on your hand, on your hands. And this is actually why it takes, it can take a year to two years to develop these models manually, uh, which is the, the earlier paradigm for developing these models. Um, 
It's because if your reactome is incomplete or incorrect and you can't produce some biomass metabolites, your model won't solve properly. So what we've done is to implement a meta-optimization approach that will automatically gap fill the network or postulate alter alterations to the model to render it solvable. And we use an, an optimization approach because we essentially apply a cost. We define a cost for each model alteration and we want to minimize the sum of those costs. We want to minimize the number of alterations to the model that, that are made. And so we use a, a mixed integer linear programming system called SKIP from Germany to, to solve these optimization problems. And what we've done is to generalize an approach called reaction gap filling that was developed earlier by Costas Moranis's group at Penn State. And they started out with two basic types of alterations to the model that the computer would generate. One is that it would postulate reversals to reaction directions because sometimes in your model you may have a correct reaction but you have it in the wrong direction and so it doesn't work properly. Their reaction gap filling approach would also postulate adding additional reactions to the model from an external database. In our case we use MetaPsych as the source of external reactions that could be added to the model. Now we, we've added another refinement which is to make the cost of adding a reaction be a function of the taxonomic domain of that reaction. So it's more expensive to add a plant reaction than it is to add a bacterial reaction to a bacterial model. We've extended this gap filling paradigm in a few other ways because you, your model actually may be missing nutrients or secreted compounds that prevent the model from solving properly. So we've added a metabolite gap filling component. And also our software will tell you if even after all this gap filling there are some biomass metabolites that can't be created by the model, it will tell you which ones so that you can focus your model debugging energies on those remaining uh, biomass metabolites. And what we found is that the, this automatic gap filling uh, works fairly well. It's able to convert an insolvable model to a, a soluble model. Uh, we found when applying it to a human metabolic model that uh, about half of the suggested changes that it made to a model, when we looked up those reactions that it proposed to insert in the model, we actually found they were known experimentally to be in humans and our curators had missed them. Uh, over the years. And so using these tools we've decreased the time that's required to construct these models from about a year to several weeks. We've, we've developed a, a couple of these models now. We've also been able to speed the analysis of FBA results by essentially painting the flux patterns onto metabolic map diagrams that, that really facilitates comprehension of where the high fluxes are. And our, our software overall allows us to create uh, much richer FBA models because really now a pathway genome database is a model and we can use all our query and visualization techniques to inspect and query and navigate through the, the reactions in a model and how they're coupled to the genome of the organism and the regulatory network of the organism. Put another way, the way I view what we've done is to really marry systems biology modeling with model organism databases. And we found there are a lot of synergies between the two because the, the curation that we do for our model organism databases like E. coli really improves the, the quality of the systems biology modeling. And modeling is an important, sorry, curation is an important component of modeling. So why not do your curation all in one place for both the modeling and the database. We've also found that in the course of running your models and debugging your models, you find a lot of uh, missing information uh, that drives the curation process. And I'll give you some examples of that in just a minute. So here's a, an FBA model that we've developed for E. coli from the EcoPsych database. Here's the list of biomass metabolites in the model. It contains the amino acids, the NTPs, the DNTPs, lipids and cell wall components and cofactors and a variety of other compounds that E. coli produces. 
We use the list of nutrients uh, listed here and a couple different secreted compounds. And here's how we validated the model. Let's focus on the second column for the moment. Uh, we've collected, we've had an effort recently to collect within EcoPsych both a number of high throughput knockout data sets for E. coli as well as a number of um, growth assays using phenotype microarrays and individual nutrient assays where people have grown E. coli under many different nutrient conditions and assayed for growth or no growth. And we have 337 different um, conditions of growth or no growth that are cataloged in EcoPsych. And using our FBA model, we're able to predict 256 of those conditions. We're able to predict growth or no growth correctly for 256 out of the 337 conditions, 76% accuracy. Using the gene knockout data, we're able to predict computationally with 86% accuracy whether a given gene knockout is lethal or not for E. coli. And this is in contrast to the model developed over many years by Bernard Paulson's group, which has amazingly similar prediction for uh, the different um, growth conditions that they considered, although a smaller number of growth conditions. And right now their model still has higher accuracy for the essentiality data, but we'll be, we'll be working on that. And, and overall, what we're doing now is to look at all these cases where it's made incorrect predictions and try to track down why that is. Often it's because we're missing transporters or ha sometimes have reactions in the wrong direction in the database. So it's, it's leading us to identify both places where our database doesn't reflect known experimental knowledge and there are also cases where there is no knowledge about what transporters or enzymes E. coli is using to grow under a given experimental condition. Okay, let me now go to the, my last two topics. The first is computational discovery of novel metabolic pathways. So what, what we've done, the, the way our pathway procedure work, prediction procedure works right now is essentially by recognizing in new genomes known pathways from metapsych. But I think a, a, a great challenge for bioinformatics is to compu computationally discover novel metabolic pathways. And here's, here's a, an initial approach for doing so. The inputs to this approach are a target genome in which you'd like to discover novel pathways and hundreds of reference genomes. Because this is a comparative genomics-based approach that uses genome context methods that have been under development in bioinformatics for about a decade now and I think are one of the more exciting methods to come out of bioinformatics. The, the outputs of this method are, first of all, pairwise functional linkages between genes. That is, what the algorithm will do is to look at every possible pair of genes in the genome that we're analyzing and compute whether there's a likely functional linkage between those genes, meaning are they likely to work together in the same pathway or the same complex. And I'll tell you in just a minute how that works. And what we do is to compute a large network within the genome of all these functional linkages. So each circle here is a gene and we draw a line between, between the genes if there's likely to be a functional linkage between them. We then use a click finding algorithm, which is a kind of algorithm in computer science and graph theory for finding connected components of this very large network. So we might have a connected component that says, Every one of these genes is connected to every one of the other genes. And every one of these four genes is connected to every one of the other genes. And so our hypothesis is that those highly connected clusters within the network are likely to be either novel pathways or protein complexes. So how do we compute these pairwise um, functional relatedness scores? Well, we use the gene neighbor method, which is one of several genome context methods that have been developed in bioinformatics. And the assumption of that method is that genes whose products function together tend to cluster across many genomes. They may cluster meaning they're nearby to one another. They may not be nearby to one another in every genome, but if we look across hundreds or thousands of genomes, 
we can often find a signal. And the idea is what this method does is for each gene pair, we find in a starting genome, we find the locations of its best homologs in all our reference genomes, and we compute the nucleotide distance between those genes. And we say that there's a functional relationship if, if the score computed from those distances uh, exceeds some p-value. Now, we've developed this as more of a, a research algorithm that we use internally. We haven't actually made this public yet uh, because it's fairly complicated to get this working across thousands of genomes, and we haven't developed the web interface for it yet, although it is published in this paper. And if you look up this publication, you'll see that we have a website where we have made available for E. coli, B. B subtilis, and uh, I think Schuonella um, the computed pathways based on this method. But we hope this, we're, we're working on making this public and hope to have it within BioPsych within a year or so for all the genomes in BioPsych. As part of this publication, we tested the method out on E. coli, and the method was able to rediscover 41 of the 261 pathways that were known in EcoPsych that contained at least four genes. So it's not perfect, but it was able to rediscover quite a few known pathways. Here are some examples of known pathways it rediscovered, histidine biosynthesis, tryptophan biosynthesis, and also the ATP synthase complex. So we, we now the, what's, what's often not so trivial is figuring out what is the pathway. Uh, often some of the genes in a cluster will have known functions that may give you a clue to what the pathway is, is but unfortunately it's not trivial going from a predicted pathway to what experiment do you do to test if that pathway is correct. So let me close with a quick description of the next algorithm that we've developed, which is an algorithm for predicting alternative minimal nutrient sets of an organism from its metabolic network. So the inputs to this algorithm are the metabolic network of an organism, such as a PGDB, and a list of the transportable compounds for the organism, which usually you get by eyeballing all the transporters in the organism and extracting their substrates. And so that's a bit of a limitation of the method is that if the transport list, transporter list is incomplete or incorrect, uh, that's going to bias what the method can do. So, so, for what, so we're basically assuming that the minimal nutrient set of an organism is a subset of those transportable compounds. The, the outputs of the algorithm are a set of alternative minimal nutrient sets where we say that uh, a subset of that transportable compound list that we'll call N is a minimal nutrient set if, first of all, N can be used to produce through the metabolic network all the biomass metabolites of the organism. And second, we, we've introduced a constraint called the make it if you use it constraint, which is that if any intermediate metabolite is used by the metabolic network in producing biomass metabolites, then the model has to show a net production by the network of that metabolite because of, as cells divide, that they're successively diluting their contents. And if we don't do that, we're, we are assuming that um, eventually the network's going to stop working properly. And finally, the subset N is a minimal nutrient set if there's no subset of N for which the previous conditions are true. So we've also run this algorithm on E. coli, and under anaerobic conditions, it predicted 787 alternative growth media minimal nutrient sets for E. coli. And we also developed an algorithm, because it's kind of hard to go through a list of 787 uh, uh, minimal nutrient sets and determine if they look correct, we also developed an algorithm that would partition those nutrient sets into equivalence classes. Or more precisely, the nutrients themselves are put into equi equivalence classes. So for example, um, and, and what, it, what the algorithm found was 21 different equivalence classes of nutrients that, of which most corresponded to the carbon sources, the nitrogen sources, the sulfur sources, or say dual sources of carbon and nitrogen or carbon and phosphorus. And what the algorithm says is that it deems two compounds to be equivalent if 
compound one will substitute for compound two, that is, anywhere you have a nutrient set involving carb compound one, you'll also have a nutrient set where compound two substitutes for compound one. When we checked those minimal nutrient sets against the experimental data that we had, we found that they were predicted with 72% accuracy. That was over on the order of 100 uh, of the growth media, since we don't have experimental data for all 787 of those. And so the next thing we'd like to do with this algorithm is to apply it to other genomes, uh, in particular to try to predict um, minimal nutrient sets for unculturable microbes, we think, I think is a great challenge. And I'll just note a few things about this approach, that it, unlike some other approaches that have been developed using flux balance analysis, this approach considers all combinations of nutrients. This is actually quite a hard combinatorial problem because there are, if you have a couple hundred transportable substrates, there are many, many, many different combinations of those substrates that can be generated. Other approaches tend to assume the substitutability of nutrients, that, it assume, that is, it assumes that every carbon-containing compound would be substitutable for every other carbon-containing compound. And for example, you, you, you don't have a cell that, that for which one combination of carbon and nitrogen sources will work, but if we substitute a different nitrogen source, suddenly that carbon source stops working, which may, perhaps it doesn't happen in biology, but it is theoretically possible. And so if we don't consider all combinations, uh, we would never find such an occurrence. And we also have a parallel implementation of this algorithm that literally takes months to run on 24 processor machines or so. Uh, so it, unfortunately, the, the approach is rather slow, so we want to try this on some of the smaller genomes. So let me wrap up. Uh, I've, I've told you about the overall approach that's used to automate the generation of metabolic models from sequenced genomes by going through reactome inference, pathway inference, model generation and model gap filling. I've talked about our MetaPsych family of 4,000 or so pathway genome databases, of which about 3,000 are available through our BioPsych website. They're all generated using the Pathway Tools software, which is freely available to academics. And I've talked about algorithms for computational discovery of novel metabolic pathways and computation of alternative minimal nutrient sets of an organism from its metabolic network. And let me thank my coworkers at SRI and many collaborators, including a great Australian scientist, Ian Paulson, who I've been working with for many years, and thank our funding sources at the NIH and the Department of Energy. Thanks for your attention.